I'm finally back. I took some time off to recharge, and it's also taken a lot longer than I expected to get save and load mostly working. There's still some problems I need to work out, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. First, I want to mention that my roguelike tutorial is now on GitHub if you want to take a look at that finished source code. It used to be exclusive to Patreon supporters, but I removed that support tier a long time ago, so there was no other way to really get to those project files. I decided it's finally time to open it up to the public. But I also want to talk a little bit about the initial loading screen and how I'm preloading resources. Originally, my plan was just to load the resources and update the progress bar on a separate thread, but somehow updating that progress bar from a different thread was causing crashes, and I didn't get very far into debugging that before I discovered the Resource Interactive Loader class. It's designed specifically for this scenario, to load resources in chunks even, so you can show progress through a single resource, but if you do that on the main thread, it's too inconsistent. It blocks for different amounts of time for different chunks, and if you're animating something, it'll just randomly stop and start. So I tried doing the resource interactive loader polling on a separate thread, but still updating the progress bar on the main thread, which is what I'm still doing right now, but it gives me some strange errors about setting surface materials. I googled around about this and I found that apparently this is a problem with resource interactive loader and multi-threading because it's a sort of obsolete class that was designed for single threaded processors. And this discussion was talking about how they're going to redesign some of this for Godot 4.0, but in the meantime, probably the right solution is to load the resources normally on a separate thread like I was before and just update the progress bar on the main thread. I'm not sure if I'm going to bother changing that yet just because despite the errors, everything seems to still be working. All the materials are showing up the way I expect, so I'm not really sure if it's even really a problem. But the next complication was that while the resource loader will cache resources to avoid reloading them the next time you ask for it, it will evict things even when there's not memory pressure. Specifically, my crew model was getting evicted before you actually got into the game, so it would still hang for a couple of seconds loading that the first time you try to hire a crew member. So all I have to do to prevent that is hold a reference to each resource, and I'm doing that in my session class. It just forces everything to stay in memory, and because my game is small enough, that's not a problem to have every resource in memory all the time. That might change when I get final art for the locations though, in which case I'll probably only keep one location loaded at a time and preload the next one while you're in hyperspace, but I'll talk about that if and when it becomes necessary. So let's move on to save and load. Pretty much the only thing I have in common with the original approach I used in the prototype is that I'm still using a dictionary to pack everything, and I'm having high level classes call into other classes to save their content to a dictionary, and they may call into other classes that save their content into a dictionary so that I just nest dictionaries within dictionaries within dictionaries. And I'm doing this for a few reasons. For one thing, it's just easy. The order of content in a dictionary doesn't matter, so if I change how things are nested or what order things are saved in, that doesn't matter. It's also just easy to use key value pairs to look things up. But also, it's human readable when it gets saved to JSON, so if I'm debugging, I can easily see what's gone wrong in a save file, or if modders want to write tools for editing save files in the future, that shouldn't be very hard. Where things differ, though, is how I'm resolving references to other objects. In the prototype, I would basically keep a list of references that are not yet resolved, and then after everything's loaded aside from those references, I'd go back and fix them up. What I'm doing now is basically recreating the objects first and then loading their data afterward. So for instance, with board objects and chips, I instance the scene for every one of those up front. And then later on, I go back and pass in the dictionary for their content, for their data, so that they can reconstruct all the references then after the objects they want to reference already exist. I'm still using numeric save IDs that are assigned on demand to actually represent them in the file. And for the most part, it's just a mechanical process of going through all the headers, seeing what information needs to be saved, and one by one packing them into the dictionary. The biggest complication there at save time is with variant fields. So for mod support, I've got custom data fields on jobs and on board objects where you can store anything. The game doesn't need to know what it is as long as the mod script understands what to do with it. And I could make something that's robust for saving whatever data types you want, but the stock JSON parser class that both reads and writes JSON will convert a lot of things to strings, even if you don't want them to, or number types, for instance, will not preserve whether they're an integer or a float type. So for now, I'm taking the easy way out. For these variant fields, I'm converting them to strings, where I have the type name, a colon, and then the information represented as a string. 
It gets complicated if you want to do things like nested arrays or dictionaries of strings that might contain things that look like other arrays or dictionaries. So what I'm doing for now is just documenting the combinations of types that are allowed. I'm trying not to spend too much time on things that might not even really be necessary because really you can probably get by with the types that are currently allowed for pretty much any kind of mod content you want to create. Things got a little bit trickier at load time though. I kept discovering new dependencies of order of operations where for instance if you try to create a ship before you create the universe, the ship tries to restore its location in the universe before everything's ready for that. And so I've had to go through and step by step as I find these problems document the reasons why step A needs to be done before step B so that then when I find I need to do step B before something else I can make sure I interleave those properly. And so my restore method in the main session class is full of these comments about dependencies. There's probably a better way to engineer this to be less fragile to order of operations, but at this stage in development, I don't want to make the kind of changes that might be necessary for that. For now, most things are working, but new bugs are still cropping up here and there, especially because some things depend on very specific scenarios. Like, for instance, if you have more than one unit, when restoring the first unit, it tries to refresh the UI for the unit list, but some of the units in that list aren't finished restoring it, which caused a crash. Just little things like that I keep discovering, and that's why I'm not really finished yet. Now, of course, to test any of this, I also needed some UI to initiate the save and load, so I finally introduced a pause menu, and I'm actually pleasantly surprised by how Godot handles pausing. Each node has a field defining how it behaves when the scene is paused, and the default is to inherit from the parent node, so you can easily make an entire section of the UI be excluded from being paused, such as my pause menu, so it continues to receive all the input events, but everything else ignores input events so I don't accidentally trigger something like placing an object or moving a unit. I've decided to let the user name their save files, and I'm using that name in the actual file name, so I had to strip out special characters. I was a little bit surprised that the text input fields in Godot don't have an easy way to do that, but I'm using a regular expression to, every time the text is changed, strip out anything I don't want, and then if anything actually gets removed, I just put the selection cursor back where it was, and it just seems as if you can't type those characters into the field. On the main menu, when you click load game, it pops down a list of all the save files, and that list will be scrollable if you have enough to fill up the screen. And of course, quitting to the main menu has its own complications, tearing down all the game state while keeping all the content loaded so I don't have to show that loading screen again. Luckily Godot has some nice monitors built in to show you how many resources, objects, and orphaned nodes there are so you can easily spot things that are being leaked. There's even a handy method to print out a list of all the orphaned nodes. So that's where I am at the moment. I need to do a bit more debugging before I put out that playtest build I was talking about, but hopefully in the next devlog I'll be announcing a playtestable version. In the meantime, it always helps me out if you hit the like button, spread the word, and subscribe if you haven't already. And of course, thanks for watching.